Maple Leafs training camp started today for the 2021 season and a bunch of members of the organization allowed words to come out of their head, which is very interesting and we should talk about it. Well, let's not waste any time at the first topic because I've gotten a bunch of messages. Oh, when are you going to do a lineup prediction video or a roster prediction video? Well, it's a little bit more difficult this year. Taxi squad and whatnot, but I'm glad I didn't make a video because I would have been wrong all the way down. And I'm willing to bet most of you would have been too because this is what they came up with. Chris Johnson just decides to drop this. Joe Thornton will start with Austin Matthews and Mitch Marner. And then 15 minutes later, he realizes that's not a juicy enough tweet. Joe Thornton's most common line mates at 5-on-5 five five last season were Marcus Sorensen and Kevin LeBanc. <gasps> oh. So Joe Thornton, whose NHL career began in 1997 and is a whole 41-year-old man and a center, is going to be left wing on the Leafs' top line. Reactions range from, yo, this is really stupid, to, hey, this is really fun. My reaction right now is on that, hey, this is really fun angle, and I'll tell you why. I don't know if you've noticed this whole pandemic thing, but options for entertainment have been a little bit limited, and hockey has been very limited. And as someone who's been re-listening to all the Harry Potter books over and over again, and watching nothing but Red Dead Redemption 2 content on YouTube because anxiety makes it difficult to enjoy new things, I like the excitement it's kinda cool. And here were the answers we got for the rest of the roster. I, I wouldn't have got any of this. Maple Leafs lines to start. Thornton Matthews Marner. Wouldn't have had that. VC, as in Jimmy VC, as in that guy you forgot signed with the Leafs. John Tavares and William Nylander would not have called that. Ilya Mikheyev, Alexander Kerfoot up the middle, and Zach Hyman on the right. Wayne Simmons left wing on the fourth line with Jason Spezza and Alexander Barabanov, who you also forgot was on the Leafs, but guess what he is? Outside looking in to start, Nick Robertson, Travis Boyd, Pierre Engvall, and Joey Anderson. And that's just the forwards, but we'll start from the bottom up. Let's go with Travis Boyd first because he's the easiest. He's a depth center option. He'll probably get into some games. Pierre Engvall is technically, I guess, losing a roster spot here. Year, even though he didn't make the Leafs out of camp, he was a regular Leaf by a, <laughs> Babcock's firing, actually. Pretty sure Engvall's first career NHL game was Babcock's last as Leafs coach, the Patan game. And then there's Joey Anderson as well, who played a bunch of games for the New Jersey Devils last season. In my mind, Pierre Engvall and Joey Anderson know the deal here, and they have nothing to complain about. I actually really liked Engvall in the playoffs, especially at center. He was fast. He had a really difficult time putting the puck in the net or doing anything offensively as for his, his first few games, but he signed a contract extension before all of this gestures vaguely at the world, and he's making $1.25 million. He never would have got that deal post-COVID. Joey Anderson, on the other hand, $750,000 against the cap, but he signed for three years. Both these guys, like, you, you know the deal here. Train hard, get better, capitalize on your opportunities. Nick Robertson is extremely tough. I like this play in the bubble, but it wasn't so good that he should be guaranteed a roster spot. He's been here since May. He avoided the World Juniors so that he could try to make this team. The OHL is supposed to begin in February, but that's not looking awesome right now. And if he plays seven games, whoop, burn the first year of his ELC. So does it make sense for him to be in the NHL with the Leafs? The taxi squad changes everything. So we'll go up to the fourth line, for example, and you look at Wayne Simmons, Jason Spezza, Alexander Barabanov. You go, why is Nick Robertson not in the lineup? Because of this random Alexander Barabanov guy I've never heard of, and you're gonna make Wayne Simmons play as offside? What's that all about? I would rather have either of those guys, I don't care at what position on the fourth line, because Nick Robertson, when he's in the lineup, should not be on the fourth line, unless it's an emergency. This guy scored over 50 goals in the OHL in a season that was cut short. When he's in the lineup, I want it to be because the Leafs are confident in him playing in the top nine. Chris Johnson has said a few times when he appeared on the podcast, the Leafs always do right by their KHL signings, and they do. Look at what they've done with Ilya Mikheyev. Barabanov was never going to be a healthy scratch to start the season, unless he's really, really bad out of camp. We have no real reason to think that would happen. The only guy I can ever think of that happening to is Petri Contiola. If you're going to have Thornton at first line left wing, Spezza absolutely deserves to continue to play center there, and Wayne Simmons 100% should be on the lineup. He, he can probably play both wings. I don't know how much left wing he's played. I imagine he knows a thing or two. That third line is really fun. It has the potential to be annoying, which I like. Ilya Mikheyev appears to be better after his wrist injury. He was flying to start the bubble. Uh, unfortunately, he didn't really produce much in the playoffs, but I mean, five games. Very briefly, before he got injured, I really liked 
like the line of him, Engvall, with Alexander Kerfoot. And Zach Hyman, need I say more, you know what he can do. He can play on the left, he can play on the right. He had an unbelievable goal scoring pace last year. He can hit, he'll win every puck battle, he can take the occasional face off even. The Leafs improving their defense was so important and locking up a good backup goalie was so important. But they don't have a uh, shutdown line. Or if you give Matthews or Tavares the shutdown duties, at least another line who can like help. The biggest problem with the Leafs depth last season besides a lack of production was a lack of identity. And this line to me has an identity. It's fast and it's annoying. And more importantly, defensively responsible. Tavares Nylander VC is a <laughs> Fascinating one. I kind of thought VC would end up with Kerfoot because they played college together and were really good. Uh, that was a bunch of years ago though. Nylander and Tavares uh, are good. They're good. So all you need on their left is someone who plays their role. And VC over the past few years has been used sparingly as a scoring threat, but he's been more of kind of like a grinder, a depth guy. But I imagine with the ice time and some open ice, he's a threat. He scored 17 a few times. If you're defending that line, who are you worried about? You're worried about John Tavares or William Nylander and just two terrifying net front presences. For anyone scoffing at Nylander being a net front presence, go and look at a compilation of all his goals from last year. I know he looks pretty, but he was a garbage man, just think. Yep. Fascinated to see what VC does with this opportunity. He's got to be responsible, and I, I, I got to imagine he knows what a huge opportunity this is. He's making under a million bucks. If he has an amazing season here, oh, he could cash in. And then the top line... <laughs> I mean, you know what you're getting with Matthews and Marner. Matthews is going to shoot. Marner's going to pass. Fortin is going to pass. But one of the quotes that came out of today is Marner wants to be more of a scoring threat. And that makes a lot of sense. He's got a great shot. And he knows how to put the puck in the net. We always look at him as a playmaker. And, like, I talk about this team all the time, and I didn't even realize this. His first season in the NHL, 19 goals in 77 games. That's a 20-goal pace. 22 goals in 82 games. 26 goals in 82 games. And he had 16 in just 59 this year. This past year, whatever you want to call it. I've been in my basement this whole time! Thornton, on the other hand, 16 goals a couple years ago and just 7 in 70 this past season. Although he had 5 goals in 12 games in Davos in the Swiss League, which means nothing. I mean, it's cool. If he had struggled over there, it would be an alarm bell. But, I mean, I mean I'm mean, i not going to expect him to be a point-of-game player again in the NHL. But he can shoot. He can definitely pass. He's got meat and size. And you know what? Veteran presence uh, is overused because it doesn't explain what veteran presence is. It's not just about Joe Thornton being a leader and talking guys through situations, hey Austin, what I would have done, and hey Mitch. It's about campaigning to the ref. For years now, it's been a complaint that, oh, the lead, there, there could have been a penalty here, a penalty there. Oh, the Leafs style just doesn't welcome penalty calls. What are you talking about? They hold on to the puck and then they get hooked. And then they complain about it to the official and they don't want to hear it from some kid who's barely older than their own sons. But this season, Thornton skates in there to a little huddle afterwards. He pulls a little agenda out of his beard and he goes, don't you remember this penalty from 2007 you called on me? Do I think this will last the entire season? No. He's 41 and there's a taxi squad. Why would you play him every single game, let alone on the first line? But am I both jacked to see it and think it'll actually kind of do okay? Yeah, I do. On defense, it's a little bit murkier. We got this from Jonas Siegel. The Leafs will be split into two groups when on-ice work gets underway Monday morning. Could look something like this, assuming they jump right into an NHL group, an NHL aspiring group. So if you look down at the defensive pairings, we have Morgan Riley and TJ Brody. Ah! Thank you! Sorry, I was worried. Jake Muzzin and Justin Hall, that makes sense, they played a lot together. Travis Dermott and Zach Bogosian, that sounds like a terrible time. And Rasmus Sandin, Miko Lettinen. I have no idea what to make of that. Riley Brody is exactly what you expected. Uh, TJ Brody was signed to be Morgan Riley's defense partner. He will play on Riley's right side. That's my assumption. Muzzin Hall, uh, they were Sheldon Keefe's shutdown pairing of choice for most of last season. That's no surprise. Dermot and Bogosian and Sandine Lettinen seem like two very pointed pairings. Travis Dermot and Zach Bogosian is your bad time pair. Dermot's going to be annoying, and then if you get in his face, Zach Bogosian will unhinge his jaw and eat you. They can both move the puck, let's not make any mistakes here, but they're a bad time. Rasmus Sandin and Mikko Lettinen, 
I mean, NHL teams have moved on to four forwards and one defenseman on the power play, and the Leafs are no different. But if there were ever a good reason to have two defensemen out there, Sandine Lettinen could work. Lettinen does an unreal job, or has done an unreal job, as a power play option in the KHL. Rasmus Sandine looked pretty darn good on the Leafs' second unit at the back half of last year. The problem with those pairs is only one of them is going to make the opening night lineup. We already talked about the KHL rule with Alexander Barabanov. Does that not apply to Miko Lettinen? But Zach Bogosin just kind of won the Stanley Cup. You just burned the first year of Rasmus Sandine's ELC, but you're you're not going to put him in the lineup, but you also didn't have him in the lineup in the bubble. And Travis Dermott has been a Leaf for years now, and he just signed an extraordinarily team-friendly deal. I think all four of these guys are going to play plenty of games for the Leafs this upcoming season, but as we saw last year with Jason Spezza, being in the opening night lineup means something, right? I kind of wonder if it means less this year on account of there's not going to be any friends and family stuff like that, a whole building roaring for you. No, it's empty. Your friends, your family, they'll be watching from home with the rest of the fans. All the Canadian politicians watching from some island somewhere, they don't care. I do find it very interesting though that these are the two pairings that they went with because a lot of people on Twitter I saw were doing their predictions and they thought Dermot Lettinen I just don't think that'll work out. I think they both want the puck, they both want to rush it up, they can pass, they can shoot. Really curious to see what they do there. Important note from Kyle Cushman, this would mean the following players under contract do not attend camp. Mikhail Abramov, he's in the QMJHL and also in the World Juniors right now with Russia. Semyon Durogachintsev, he's in the KHL. Philip Hollander, the SHL. Igor Korshkov is going to stay in the KHL, it looks like. Kali Kosala, he's going to the German League, he just cleared waivers. Philip Kral, he just signed an NHL deal in the spring, he's in the Czech League. And Dennis Ma who has just re-signed, he's playing, no, that's not Newfoundland, it's uh, it's the Swiss League. They call it the National League, but my brain for a second was like, no, he plays in Newfoundland. Malgin was a bit of a surprise, but re remember I was talking about him when the Leafs re-signed him, and when the Marchment trade happened? Dennis Malgin was actually, even though he had over 200 games of NHL experience, he's younger than Mason Marchment. The Leafs are deep enough, Malgin was probably not really going to get into many games this year. Why not continue to play in Switzerland and hopefully he sticks around for a while? He, he still, he'll be in his mid-twenties by the time he gets here. I mean, so will Korshkov at this rate? All those guys, ah, eh, let him play as much hockey as possible because it's difficult to even get into the minors right now. The AHL hasn't started. The Newfoundland Growlers aren't going to have a season at all. And one final note on the goalies, no real surprise there. You obviously have Frederick Anderson, Jack Campbell is going to be backing him up, and then there's Aaron Dell in camp as well. He wants the backup job and Michael Hutchinson is there, who was the backup last year. It's a very busy crew. And Dubas mentioned, well, I don't want what happened a couple years ago, losing McElhaney and Pickard to waivers, and then I remembered that happened, and I got upset again. Again. A quote from Sheldon Keefe, I thought this was very, very interesting. From Chris and Sheldon, Sheldon Keefe on what he wants to see from the Leafs this season. Competitiveness, physicality, and structure, and our ability to make it more difficult to get to our net. And of course, consistency. Keefe said camp will be about practices and practice habits. Now, if you closed your eyes and I never told you that was Sheldon Keefe, you'd be like, that's Babcock, right? But coaches value those things, like all of them. But competitiveness? That's something that we as a fan base complained about way too often last year, that they didn't even look competitive. Physicality? That's something we also complained about. They don't even hit anybody. And structure? Oof, Maron trying to defend a lead, these guys. They played without any at times. But practice and practice habits to me was very interesting because practice is going to be big. And it's not just about showing up every day and trying hard and looking good like Zach Hyman always gets complimented. Nick Robertson has been obviously impressing the organization. But the Leafs usually like barely practice throughout the season. Other than their morning skates, they barely get a formal practice. Last year they had, what was it, 14 back-to-backs? And then there's the bye week and mandatory days off. The fact that the coach they went into the playoffs with wasn't even their coach in training camp. I'd love to know the amount of full actual practices Sheldon Keefe got with the Toronto Maple Leafs last year. I can't imagine it was many. This year, all things equal, they don't have to compete with the Taylor Swift concert or the Raptors. I'm very curious to see what the Leafs are able to do actually practicing. At very least practicing as much as everyone else because the schedule is relatively even now. So, 
I'll leave it at that because I'm sure there's going to be plenty more to talk about over the next little while. I'm also doing World Juniors videos, Canada's got the semi-final and hopefully the gold medal game coming up. Videos, they're going to come fast and furious, the podcast is going to start ramping up. Oh, hockey's here baby! I'm so excited, finally. So if you got a comment, leave it in the comment box down below. But for now, that is it for this one. Thank you very much for watching. Click like if you like this video. Click subscribe if you really like to tell your friends. Oh, I'm about to watch another Red Dead video. I hate myself.